Constitutional Conversations is a series of discussions by America's leading scholars about the principles, framing, ratification, and implementation of constitutional government in the United States. This series is hosted by the James Madison Memorial Fellowship Foundation of Alexandria, Virginia. We think of the 18th century as, as Thomas Paine, for example, called it, the age of reason. And there's good reason to call it the age of reason. It was the age of enlightenment. But we must always remember that it was also the age of awakening. And during particularly the 1740s and 50s, those decades that immediately preceded the American Revolution, there was a, a religious phenomenon that swept the colonies from north to south and uh, it burned brightest during those 40s and 50s. And there were two individuals that we tend to associate with that. George Whitfield, who was an English uh, clergyman, an Anglican in fact, an evangelical Anglican who came to America uh, numerous times to preach and evangelize. And then an American, Jonathan Edwards, who eventually would come to what's now Princeton University to become its president. But those two, Edwards and Whitfield, were sort of the spearheads of the Great Awakening. And this was a movement that cut across all kinds of barriers, if you will. It cut across racial barriers. It cut across class barriers. It cut across geographical barriers. And it was a phenomenon that was much reported in the press. In fact, there are contemporary scholars who call the Great Awakening the, our first national media event, for example. So, I think there's a very real sense in which an, an incipient sense of nationhood begins to develop during these decades of the Great Awakening. And it does something else, too. It, it um, creates in Americans a sense that perhaps age-old authorities can and should be undermined. For example, many people during this awakening period um, have what they consider to be an immediate experience of God's grace. They go to hear George Whitfield, for example, a very powerful preacher who loved the common folk and uh, carried around, had built for him a portable pulpit that he would set up in the middle of a field, for example, and thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of people would gather to hear him preaching. And uh, he had to do that because he was refused the pulpits of the established churches, particularly the Anglican churches, of which he was a member. And uh, they would stand there in these fields and they would hear uh, Whitfield preach to them directly from the scriptures uh, of God's grace. And uh, they had experiences. And they, they felt that they were experiencing God afresh directly. And they didn't depend on a... Uh, on a clerical class. They didn't depend on uh, an authority structure for that experience. And I think that the popular religiosity of the Great Awakening was translated in subsequent decades, the 1760s and 70s, into the popular constitutionalism that we see Americans articulating. That authorities in the state, perhaps, are not uh, necessary any more than they are in the church. And uh, consent, the doctrine of consent of essentially equal people, and recall our Declaration of Independence, declaring that all men are created equal, has its roots in that great awakening of the 1740s and 50s. And I think a case can be made that the popular religiosity of the great awakening and its incipient sense of nationalism translate into the popular constitutionalism of the revolutionary period. Constitutional Conversations is made possible by a generous grant from the Fairley S. Dickinson, Jr. Foundation. Constitutional Conversations is made possible by the James Madison Education Fund.